It's that time of year. A whole lot of Americans come together to give thanks. But what are we really thankful for and whom should we really be thanking? Today we hear from Native American activists Michelle Cook and Hartman Dietz about the ongoing struggle for autonomy and environmental survival that's taken them into U.S. courtrooms and corporate boardrooms seeking justice. And we report on the thousand people in attendance at the American Museum of Natural History on Indigenous Peoples Day. They were there with one goal, to decolonize the place. And they're demanding that the museum rename, reclaim, and respect their heritage. Giving thanks and making amends this week on The Laura Flanders Show. It's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The Dakota Access Pipeline protests, also known by the hashtag no Dapple, attracted world attention as indigenous people from myriad nations put their bodies on the line to stop the construction of a pipeline across precious lands. Today, the activism sparked at Standing Rock takes many forms and the threats facing Native Americans are escalating. Here to talk about both are Michelle Cook, a human rights lawyer who is right now participating in a delegation of indigenous women meeting with bankers and rating agencies about the role that finance plays in perpetuating the fossil fuel economy, and Hartman Dietz, a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag Nation, whose national status the Trump administration recently saw fit to question, putting valuable tribal lands at risk in Massachusetts. I'm so glad the two of you have come in. Um, We've got a lot to talk about, but I want to start with the big story, which is where you've just come from, Michelle. Um, You've been meeting with some pretty closed-door people. Who? Over the past two years, I've had the honor and privilege of meeting with some of the world's um, most powerful decision makers, and these include uh, Deutsche Bank in Germany, Credit Suisse, uh, Byron LB, um, as well as uh, most recently MSCI here in New York, um, one of the largest credit rating agencies in the world. And you haven't been meeting with them alone? No. Who's been there? Who's been there? Um, part of the Divest, Invest, Protect campaign, um, which emerged from Standing Rock, um, uses the stories of indigenous women um, and grassroots people who are directly impacted by fossil fuel development. And we take these women directly to um, banks to have face-to-face engagements regarding those adverse impacts. So, we, so describe what we're seeing here. I mean, this is a group of the women that you're talking about. You're at, I think you said Deutsche Bank? Yes. So this, this photo um, is of the delegation in front of Deutsche Bank. And each one of these women um, have a story that is incredibly impo- powerful. For example, on the end, uh, Monique Verden, who is um, a former tribal councilwoman for the United Huma Nation. And right now, the United Huma Nation, they are fighting um, the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. Down near and, New Orleans. Yes, and, and right next to her is Charlene Alec from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation in British Columbia, who recently had a um, landmark victory um, overturning um, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline for lack of uh, consent by the indigenous and peoples. That? And that's, that's in British Columbia. Um, And so all of these women um, have incredible stories and testimony to share. And so we provide the platform for them to give that testimony. And what's the argument they're making? What's the responsibility of the financial institutions, be they banks or rating agencies, in the in the challenges you all face, we all face? We're asking for, very simply, that banks and financial institutions protect, respect, and remedy human rights abuses um, that are related to their investments or to companies that they are uh, financing. And so in the case of the Dakota Access Pipeline, for example, um, there were 38 um, banks, U.S. and international financial institutions that um, financed uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline project. And some of those banks, um, as a result of the um, human rights violations, did in fact um, stop their lending. However, many many, many banks still continue um, to fund uh, these companies despite the fact um, that we have provided credible evidence of human rights abuses um, and despite the fact that we have uh, put them on notice that um, 
these projects are very dangerous and that they threaten the cultural survival of indigenous peoples here in the United States of uh, America. All right, so Hartman, coming to you on this question of cultural survival and indigenous survival, um, it's a complicated story, what's happening in Massachusetts, but we're talking about a part of Cape Cod that is tribal land for the Mashpee Nation. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of question about the development plans for that land, but under traditional, as I understand it, U.S. trust law relations with tribal nations, that should all be in your hands to decide. Is that right? Well, absolutely. I feel that it should be in our hands to decide as, as Native people who've been on that land for 12,000 years, who's signed the 1621 agreement with uh, passengers of the Mayflower. The so-called um, pilgrims, that whole yeah, picture, that's your people. Um, and that said that they would hold their people to their laws and we would hold our people to our laws. We had a system of law here that hasn't been respected. And the very foundational problem with trust land in the United States is it comes from a foundation that says that native people are racially inferior and incapable of managing our own affairs and managing our own land and managing our own ownership over that land and so the, so the whole trust idea is the federal government will do it for you yes because they're better qualified um, and yet we've seen throughout the history of the United States of America a real failure of that trust for native people and their human rights and their rights to hold on to the things that they need to maintain our mm. cultural identity as, oh. as a distinct people and what happened this fall in Mashpee well, I guess the simple answer is that the Department of Interior decided that we were not fitting into their definition of what Native American is and that our land shouldn't be in trust because at the date of 1934, we didn't have a relationship with the federal government in that year, although we can show that we had relationships with the federal government in years previous and years since uh, because that particular year was a year that they chose to set the standard that this is now invalidates our right to live in our homeland. Is this the first time we're seeing something like this happen? It's not the first time, but it's the first time since I think the 1950s there is a, a policy known as termination in the, I think the 30s through the 50s where Congress would decide with the stroke of a pen that an uh, Indian tribe was no longer a tribe anymore, and then they would divide up their land and sell it and the resources on it and put the money into the pockets of the U.S. Treasury or whatever, um, whatever person sought to benefit from that. And that's been the pattern that we saw with that act. And, and still we see that pattern today where uh, lands that are supposed to be held in trust for the benefit of the people who've held them with the original title are disposed of to oil companies or to timber companies or to fracking or to whatever other interests want to make profit off those resources that are on the lands that we hold under our feet. So I'm hearing a few echoes here. One about who gets to decide what on behalf of whom, um, whether you're talking about the, the banks or the tr U.S. federal government. Um, human rights where do human rights play in our, our decision making around the exploitation of land and development. What else, how else do you see the, the parallels in these two stories, Michelle? Fundamentally, the United States legal system fails to recognize indigenous people's basic rights to land tenure. Um, this is a problem of racial discrimination that is part and parcel of the United States legal framework. And so we're really rubbing up against um, historic racial discrimination that has been inflicted against indigenous peoples for generations. Um, so we have a, a consistent problem of a failure to recognize fundamental human rights, such as land tenure, land rights, self-determination, and basic rights to free prior informed consent, that we have the ability to say no to projects. So why are you going, in your argument, to the banks and the rating agencies, not to the federal government or to the UN? Or right now, um, to be able to change domestic law in the United States, we're either going to need a Supreme Court decision to overturn some of these um, problematic precedent cases, um, or we're going to need acts of Congress. Um, to reverse some of these um, laws. And 
in my opinion, um, while that may be a good strategy, I think that there is much um, work that can be done to advance the rights of indigenous peoples with respect to financial institutions, because these companies um, are dependent upon the capital um, which flows into them for these projects. So if we're able to intercept that capital and to create standards of human rights within the financial and banking institutions, it's another way that we can put pressure and to, um, and to hopefully have rights that are guaranteed um, not only to Native American people, but to all U.S. citizens. So is it possible, I mean, I'm jumping way forward, Hartman, at this point, but is it possible to imagine a strategy that might go around the Department of Interior to some of the businesses that are thinking of developing that land on Cape Cod? Well, for our particular instance, I don't know if that's, um, that's our challenge. There's not a big overarching company that's mm -hmm. seeking to develop our land. It's oh, a yeah. lot of private interests that are, uh, a lot of real estate interest actually is what it comes down to. Cape Cod is a beautiful part of the world. Uh, it's become a, a destination point for vacations and it's a place where people want to own luxury homes and they want to own their vacation homes. So a lot of people that uh, have come into Mashpee and have come into Cape Cod in general have come to build a, a mansion that they live in for two weeks out of the year, if that. And it's it's those homes that are impacting our ability to get to the water to shellfish, that are uh, impacting our our ability to have acreage to grow corn. It's impacting our ability to have space where the deer go that we would traditionally hunt. Uh, it impacts our medicine plants. It impacts our ability to visit some of these yeah. places for ceremony. And your um, story has set off alarms all across Indian country, right? I mean, this could be a precedent? Absolutely. If this sets a precedence, uh, there's uh, over 100 tribes that would be immediately at threat. Um, you know, we have the, uh, the Aquina Wampanoag tribe right across the way on Martha's Vineyard Island. You know, they were recognized as a tribe in 1982. Um, and, you know, like I say, over 100 other tribes, uh, there's a number of tribes that were just recognized in D.C. this past year uh, under the Trump administration. All of their land holdings as trust land would be brought into question. Uh, many tribes in California that were dealing with the mission system so this is a fit set as a precedent. It will impact mm. native people and tribes all over the country. Uh, so it's, it's pretty alarming for what we've seen. All right, so bring me back to, to you and your women, Michelle, because as I'm listening to Hartman, I'm getting a little overwhelmed, the sense of just what we uh, and you are, are up against here in terms of asserting human rights, protecting land even that's been under treaty for, for decades. Um, addressing imminent needs of people versus corporations. And yet you and your delegation, the, the Divest, Invest, Protect campaign, have been doing this work, as you said, for a couple of years. What's been the response so far? And do you see a potential strategy here um, that could really pay off? I think that um, we've had many successes. We've been able to educate um, civil society. We've been able to educate government institutions and decision makers. And we've also been able to touch, in my opinion, the hearts of many of these financial decision makers. It's much easier to deny a human right when it's written on white paper. But when we see the hearts and the souls of these women pleading for help, um, it's undeniable the power that they carry and um, the audacity of these women to face those in seats of power is something that we all can learn from right now. There is strength in the stories of Indian women and there's strength in the stories of women generally. Have you seen these bankers be moved? The rating agencies respond in a way that makes, makes you feel like you're really being heard? Absolutely. Um, you know, while we've had some interesting experiences with some of these individuals, there's many others who's, whose heart truly have um, been pierced by these stories, who truly do care. Um, they are also human too, believe it or not, and they really do um, want to improve um, their, their due diligence processes. But my job and our job as indigenous women is to say, you're not working fast enough. There is an urgent situation of 
these women's lives being literally threatened. Um, some of these women, um, they have been threatened um, with um, violence for the work that they're doing to protect their people. And so we're really trying to impress upon them that we need your urgent attention to this, that you must change now. And as we've said, this isn't just a U.S. or American issue. It's, it's global. Are there any nations or communities elsewhere that you feel are responding um, in a way that could model a possibility of change? Um, right now, um, there are women in Central and South America who are being threatened um, with, um, with murder. The right, um, indigenous human rights defenders all over the world are threatened right now, and so we have to do something to protect them. Um, and, I, and I know that the Dutch banking sector, for example, I really think that they have the opportunity in those countries in Europe where there is um, higher human rights standards um, to, to advance and to move this conversation forward, not only for um, the U.S., but really for the whole world. It does seem to me that we in the media like to see our Native American protests out there in snowy plains. Um, and there hasn't been as much attention to what you're all doing in the suites of, of, of Wall Street. Um, talk a little bit about your frustrations, how we could cover this world of work better, and where you see the lessons from what you're doing, both of you, for, for everybody, for all of us. Indigenous peoples, we, we are protecting 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. We are the ones who are on the front line protecting what is left of this planet's forests and water. And so we are really the canary in the mine. Um, when we support indigenous peoples, we ensure our own planetary survival. We ensure our own sustainability. And so indigenous peoples are particularly important to leading um, the planet right now in the world towards sustainability, towards um, climate justice. Is there anything you'd add to that, Harmon? Um, for the Mashpee tribe, uh, we are looking for support of a bipartisan bill, H.R. 5244, and this is the Mashpee Reservation Reaffirmation Act. Uh, and this would be a, a solution that's got support from both Republican and the Democratic parties to say that as Congress, that we have a right to have our reservation held in trust. So that would be great. And a lot of these things that you're, you're talking about where they want to see the protest out in the snowy plains, they have their origin in policy. Yeah. And what eventually brings those things to a head where you see those clashes is it, they start in a boardroom. They start in Congress where decisions are made without the forethought of how those impact the, the native people. Well, so that brings us to the question of decision making and our supposed democracy and elections and the stories that we're hearing around voter disenfranchisement targeting native people's votes uh, are not reassuring. Um, what are we hearing? What do we need to be aware of and how are people going to be fighting back? Michelle. Indian people here in the United States, many of these Indian people, we live on reservations. and. For example, in Navajo Nation, where my grandmother lives, we do not have street addresses. We have P.O. boxes. Um, and this impacts our ability to vote. A basic human right that should be guaranteed to all people has been fundamentally denied to Indian people. So it is a critical issue because often Native voters have the ability to swing uh, votes in their states. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're protecting um, indigenous people's ability to have um, their voice heard in the elections. Well, this is a, a law change, I think, for targeting voters in North Dakota, switching the responsibility of the voter from having an address to having a street address. Uh, that would get the people that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is what's happening in this electoral arena of concern to you, Hartman? Does it relate to the questions you're fighting on? Well, uh, certainly what happens in any uh, electoral process in this country is of concern to me because these are the decisions that made the impact our people. Uh, and, you know, this comes back to the fundamental problems that, that come with trust land and, and the way that jurisdictions are put down for Native people and the 700 laws that impact Native people that don't impact other citizens. Uh, we're supposed to be sovereign tribal um, 
nations on equal standing to a state government, and yet we have no representation in Congress or Senate. Uh, you know, we have we don't have federal representation in the system of government which governs over us as 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 tribal governments, and that's something that I would like to see changed as well. Beyond just voter enfranchisement, uh, we should be as tribal nations, we should be empowered to have representation in the government that we're under. Again, I'm hearing echoes going back to you and your financial institutions. I mean, we've had people sitting right here who say they don't feel that they have any say over the decisions being made over their lives by financial institutions, by global corporations. Like what happens to citizenship in the, land, in the world of global finance? Um, I mean, is it just me hearing that echo? Maybe we are all find ourselves in a similar fight for representation. Absolutely, and it includes indigenous women. Um, we really need to make sure that our Indian people are able to vote here in the United States. After having so many Indian people who have and are currently serving in our armed forces, our population is one of the highest uh, populations of veterans. Um, so we serve our country and we have served our country um, since its formation and to deny um, indigenous peoples um, a vote is outrageous. But I think I'm thinking also of the sort of opaqueness of these financial institutions that you're talking about and how you're crossing that barrier into their, into their fortresses as it were, but it doesn't often happen. Right. Um, I, I, those opportunities are not going to present themselves unless Indian people and American people and global citizens demand um, those engagements. We, we have to be the ones who say we want to be heard, we will not be invisible, and whether it is arranging those meetings within um, these financial institutions or whether it's going out into the street and demanding that visibility, um, it's our responsibility to try to turn this around. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you for bringing these stories. We'll get more information about the campaigns we've mentioned here on our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Thank you both, Michelle Hartman, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The action started in 2016, that was the first time we did the action, it's called the Anti-Columbus Day Tour. Um, the first time when we did the action, it was only Decolonize This Place and NYC Stand with Standing Rock that collaborated on the action. And uh, this year, which is 2018, uh, we have about 12 groups that came together to do this action. Th there's a twofold kind of a thing when we come inside the museum. One is for all of us to hear each other, which was at the assembly. It was for us to actually build these relationships, to actually think of each other, each of our struggles. Not that we are trying to hear, say, one's oppression is the other, like how are we actually coming together. And then for the people who come and witness that we are here, <laughs> you know, that people are not living in the past, that this needs to happen now. History is now. This is the second year that BYP 100, the New York City chapter, has participated alongside Decolonize This Place in the Anti-Columbus Day Tour. It's really built out on two important historical nodes, one being in the 70s, uh, Native activists defacing the Roosevelt statue which stands behind us and being arrested for that. And then in 2015, BYP 100 led a blackout tour at this museum, going through several halls and re-narrating um, resistant histories of black diasporic life um, that is effaced in the museum. And so it's really emerged out of our commitments to black liberation, as well as engaging in solidarity struggles with indigenous peoples. Um, here at the museum, similar to how we organize at Decolonize This Place, we find different halls of issues that are expressed. And what we want to do is connect those halls through a lens of settler colonialism. And that's why we are all over the museum today. We have the Hall of African Peoples and African Mammals, Asian People and Asian Mammals, and so on. But there is no Hall of European Peoples, right? There's no Hall of European Mammals. 
right? Because that's called history, that's called science. So we're here to bring awareness to how knowledge and history is constructed um, in both like a pedagogical way, but also through direct action. And when I'm in this museum, I think of the school children, the black and brown and indigenous school children in New York City who hope to leave the oppressive environment of their classroom and standardized testing and having history that they know is not their own forced down their throat. And when they come on a field trip, they expect to be liberated. They expect to have fun. They expect to be excited. But instead, what happens is they get here and they too find themselves in the shadow of these oppressive monuments. They find themselves staring at their ancestors through glass, whereas the colonizers' ancestors get statues. So for Chinatown Art Brigade, um, we see that our peoples here are displayed next to animals um, and minerals and are part of a history at this museum of displaying uh, other cultures in a, the framework of eugenics and the framework of white supremacy. So we don't see that, uh, we don't want the objects of our, of our ancestors and of our peoples or anyone's peoples to be stolen as there are 60,000, more than 60,000 objects from this exhibit that have been stolen through colonial expeditions. Um, and they use a lot, very different language to describe how these objects were obtained, but every single piece in this exhibit was stolen. We're calling on the museum to repatriate these objects to where they came from. We're also calling on the museum very specifically to make that information available, transparent, and on display at every single display here. We demand! We we are talking about changing the entire structure of the institution. And so it's not just about, you know, being able to hire, you know, one black uh, curator or like one indigenous curator, but to actually change the entire way the institution's functioning.